Alright guys, how's it going? I was recently handed this leaked slide deck from one of Intel's marketing drives. An event held virtually, of course, as is the case with most events at this current period of time. It was the Intel Partner Connect winning in a competitive client environment. Now, this slide was supposed to have limited distribution for probably no more than a few hundred people and the usage guidelines start off with not suitable for end user messaging. I found the language here pretty interesting. This material is tailored for a tech savvy audience and therefore, in bold, is not suitable for end user messaging. And also, each slide must include the label limited distribution, not for end users. So it's uh, interesting to see that Intel considers end users, that's you watching this, as not tech savvy enough to view these slides. I guess we'll put that to the test. To be fair, they are of course generalizing here and clearly mean that the average end user won't take much away from the upcoming slides. We'll soon see if that rings true as well. But moving on to the usage instructions, and these materials are intended for Intel and its partners under NDA. Distribution beyond Intel or NDA partners limited to customers retail sales personnel or RSPs, channel personnel, I like this one, sophisticated institutional or corporate customers, for example, large enterprise, government and education sector customers. And with this, we can figure out Intel's aims here. They are really targeting the salespeople on the ground. Why? Because they are the people who help these end users make buying decisions. Channel personnel, the kinds of people making buying decisions in bulk. And ditto this last line, it is all the same, except these guys are buying in even larger scale. What's interesting here, I guess, is we've already seen Intel's initiatives with the whole real world performance angle pretty much fail to gain any traction whatsoever in the tech press, outside of sponsored articles that is, and enthusiasts. And so now, they could be trying a similar tactic at the retail level instead. These next couple of lines, I have to admit, I had a little smile to myself over these. Do not remove disclaimers or system configurations from benchmark data slides. And do not delete legal disclaimer slides or appendix slides. Obviously, I had a real go at Intel's marketing a few months back because they did remove the disclaimers, which was a flagrant violation of the FTC ordering them to provide such disclaimers in their 2010 decision and order. And so that appears to have worked, but I guess we'll see as we continue on with the deck. And I guess the last thing to note here is this shelf life, effective April 2020 through September 2020. So this is still valid today. The agenda is pretty self-explanatory. So moving on to page four and the market landscape. Competition is intense with the emergence of AMD Zen 2, seven nanometer products with performance claims highlighting core and thread count and Cinebench performance. I still find it strange when I see Intel admitting they're in a competitive situation. And we know that they are losing desktop share and mind share as well to Matisse. And we know that Renoir is in another league versus anything that they've got in mobile. And I feel that the latter may have them more concerned today. Big yellow writing, as Intel is wont to do when attempting to put a lasting message in your head. Intel stands poised to compete on real world performance and value across all segments. So is this real world performance thing all over again? Moving on to page five and how do we measure performance? And for this slide, Intel's marketing appeared to have read a book. Cuter Architecture, a quantitative approach. The fifth edition by John L. Hennessy and David A. Patterson. And from this, they've pulled out this quote, presumably in support of their upcoming claims. Our position is that the only consistent and reliable measure of performance is the execution time of real programs. And again, note this yellow writing, when Intel want you to remember the point. I too have read books though, and I actually studied computer architecture some time ago. So I decided to have a closer look at this particular paragraph just for extra context. And it reads, unfortunately, time is not always the metric quoted in comparing the performance of computers. And then the part Intel quoted, our position is that the only consistent and reliable measure of performance is the execution time of real programs, before finishing with, and that all proposed alternatives to time as the metric or to real programs as the items measured have eventually led to misleading claims 
or even mistakes in computer design. So it is definitely worth clarifying here is that it isn't just real programs that the authors take the position of being reliable, but also that those real programs should measure time as the benchmark, not something else, and that anything else eventually leads to misleading claims. And if you think about it, how many benchmarks today actually measure the time taken to complete a task? This is a bit of a tangent here, but let's think about some of the most used benchmarks. And we'll start with Intel's current least favourite benchmark, Cinebench. Although the benchmark clearly measures the time taken to render a scene from start to finish as you're watching here, it doesn't actually present the result as time though, instead preferring a point system. So I wondered then, do these points scale as you would expect based on the time taken? For example, I know I'm just pulling numbers out of my arse here. If a CPU takes 20 seconds to render the scene, and that gives a score of 1000 points, then a CPU taking 10 seconds should score 2000 points, double the points for half the time. And a CPU taking 5 seconds should score 4000 points, etc, etc. And so with my 3950X here, I decided to put this theory to the test. First of all, I ran with half the cores and threads, and then I ran the full CPU at stock value, as you've just saw there. The reason why it scores a bit less than before is because I'm also recording it at the same time. On the CPU that is. And I ran 5 tests each with the 8 cores and the 16 core setup. And I was extremely impressed by the precision of the results. Every single test, whether with 8 cores, 16 threads, or the full 16 cores and 32 threads, scored exactly the same in all 5 runs. And I simply measured the time taken with a stopwatch. And that's why there's some very slight differences in the times here. And with the results in, I took the averages of both. Then we simply needed to divide the slowest time, which was around 59 seconds, by the fastest, which was 32. And doing so gives us a time difference of 1.84. Or in other words, this one took 84% longer time to complete. To then figure out the points difference, we simply divide the highest score of 9,275 by the lowest of 5,022. And we once again see a difference of 84%. And so these results are basically exactly the same. And it would have been exact if not for my imprecision using the stopwatch. And by the way, AMD marketing, Cinebench R20 is heavily promoted by yourselves. And as Intel said, also very heavily in the tech press, 82% of reviews benchmark Cinebench. I would wager because of this that it's also downloaded quite heavily by end users for benchmarking. But when I look at the benchmark results, I see two Intel CPUs at the top here on 16,500 and 13,000 points respectively. But when I look at Tom's Hardware 3990X review, Cinebench R20 and if you ignore the overclocked results, we see that the 3990X Threadripper scores 25,000 points. And even the 3970X on 17,000 points? That would still come in ahead of Intel's dual-chip Xeon Platinum CPU. And given Intel's current disdain for the Cinebench benchmark, I'd have thought that Maxon would have been happy to show a couple of AMD chips up there at the top of the chart instead. But as you've seen, Cinebench, although it does come under some fire from Intel marketing these days, it is a real-world benchmark. It's the benchmark of their 3D software suite Cinema 4D. And because it measures and reports execution time, even though they present it in this nice and easy scoring format, it is also a reliable measure of performance. Of course, Intel's issue with Cinebench isn't so much that it's not a reliable measure of performance. Their argument is that it's because Cinema 4D was only used by 0.54% of the users in their study. And so therefore, it's not really worth benchmarking. Moving on though, to their desktop performance positioning. And a pretty interesting slide for a couple of reasons. If you recall back to this last video when I slammed Intel's marketing pretty hard, one of the reasons for that was this ludicrous comparison of their i3 mobile chips, this i3-8145U versus AMD's Ryzen 7 3700U, with Intel claiming that their i3 was up to 65% better performance, which as we all know is just absolute garbage. In this slide though, we see that Intel claims AMD positions their CPUs like this, like the Ryzen 9 versus the Core i9 and the 7 versus the Core i7, etc. I would question this analysis, however, as we've seen AMD multiple times 
compare the Ryzen 9s to Intel's high-end desktop X series chips. And clearly also the 3950X is in a higher price bracket than Intel's desktop Core i9s. But Intel claims that based on real applications, and this one here we can see in the footnote, performance as measured on Sysmark 2018 overall score. Intel reckons that based on Sysmark, this is how the chips really stack up, with the Ryzen 9 up against the Core i7 and the Ryzen 7 up against the i5s, and the Ryzen 5s more in line with the Core i3s. Now I talked about Sysmark before, and I think now it's worth taking a deeper look at this. The company who creates the benchmark, Bapco, have long been embroiled in accusations of foul play and essentially being nothing much more than a satellite of Intel Corporation's marketing. Indeed, as Tom's hardware discovered as far back as 2000, the Bapco website was registered under Intel before being hastily removed. Nothing at all suspicious there. And also, their address was uh, oddly similar to Intel's. It was Van Smith who broke the news before he was hastily removed by Tom's Hardware. Setting up his own site, Van's Hardware, he continued his investigation into Intel's relationship with Bapco and unearthed a few optimizations which strongly favored Intel CPUs, with his conclusion being, there is little remaining doubt that Intel's Sysmark 2000 played favorites with the chip giant's own processors. And in fact, it might be more accurate to call using Intel's Sysmark benchmarking rather than benchmarking. 10 years on and the accusations were still being leveled at Sysmark. This time somewhat uncharacteristically by AMD themselves and their senior vice president and chief marketing officer of the time, Nigel Dessau. Have you paid the Sysmark tax? And he said, Sysmark is a standard and repeatable workload benchmark that is actually based on an index of a number of workloads combined. And that's where the problem lies. Because to properly gauge peak capacity, the index actually tests applications and environments that are, for most of us, unrealistic and well beyond how most of us use a PC. Oh, how the wheel turns. And taking a closer look at the benchmarks, Nigel wrote, The overall Sysmark test suite includes four distinct modules, each designed to report different aspects of computing performance. These modules being office productivity, e-learning, video creation, and 3D modeling. With the most relevant to mainstream business and public sector users being that office productivity. And so integral to the office productivity subtest module are activities related to processing a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, as you might have guessed. And we can all agree the capacity to process a spreadsheet is a great thing to test. It's a classic productivity tool. The problem here though was, according to AMD, some preliminary AMD investigations regarding commercial usage scenarios indicated to them that the average spreadsheet was only about 100 rows deep and a really big one might be, say, 2,000 rows. But the Sysmark 2007 preview benchmark is based on a spreadsheet of 35,000 rows. And perhaps this is a question we can all ask ourselves, when was the last time you ran a 35,000 row spreadsheet? And this here is an important part of Sysmark that some people may not have realized. Intel are constantly beating this drum about real world performance in slide after slide after slide while citing real applications. But if the workload is unrealistic, then it's still a bad benchmark. AMD, of course, provided their own benchmark and table, which sadly on this archived webpage is no longer available. However, by their reckoning, their Athlon 2X2 took about 7% longer to complete the entire Sysmark productivity module. Not just the Excel spreadsheet, the entire productivity module took 7% longer on the Athlon. However, Intel's Core 2 Duo E8500 scored 40% higher points. Remember Hennessy's and Patterson's computer architecture, a quantitative approach? The only consistent and reliable measure of performance is the execution time of real programs. And all proposed alternatives to time as a metric or to real programs as the items measured have eventually led to misleading claims. 40% higher score for the Intel CPU when it only has a 7% actual performance advantage is a misleading claim. It is a bad benchmark and it has nothing to do with real world performance. As I noted in my older video, Intel's history of contrived benchmarks 
AMD quit to the Babco consortium soon after all this, and they were very quickly followed by Nvidia and Via. With the accusation again being that Babco were still little more than an arm of Intel's marketing division, 10 years after the first time that accusation was levelled. Question now though is, 10 years later on, are they still? When Intel really began to bang this real world drum hard to the tech press, it started around 9 months ago. This Reddit user did their own investigation into Intel's claims. As always, Sysmark plays a large part of Intel's promotion. With claims of 3% and 7% performance advantage for the 9700K and 9900K respectively over AMD's 12-core Ryzen 9 3900X. While again dismissing Cinebench as too favourable to AMD. There are alternatives to both of course with a bunch of independent benchmarks from the Ryzen 3000 launch. So this Reddit user created an application performance index with and without the rendering software. So that is without 3D Studio, Blender, Cinebench, Corona, Frybench, Indigo, Keyshot, Luxmark, PCMark Rendering Test and POV Ray and V-Ray. So pretty much every renderer included there. If you look through these 18 different mainstream tech sites when they reviewed the 3900X, on the left side of the performance index at the bottom, this was still with the rendering benchmarks included. At the 3900X was 57% and 30.5% ahead of the 9700K and the 9900K. And with all of those rendering benchmarks removed, the difference was 44% and 26%. And so it seems that yes, Intel are correct. So far in that, the rendering software does tend to favour AMD. The reason for which essentially comes down to a very high performance floating point unit and more cores. That is the simple reason why Zen 2 is faster in rendering benchmarks. However, given that all of them were removed, these results aren't really changed hugely. And we see that against the 9900K, it's only about 4.5% difference after all those renderers are removed. And so the author of this piece then decided to investigate the Sysmark results compared to the Cinebench results. And they discovered that in fact, Sysmark 2018 favoured the Intel chips by far more, almost double the percentage points compared to how well Cinebench R20 favoured AMD. And the conclusion was, if Cinebench is called for in favour of AMD, then Sysmark should be called as far more in favour of Intel. And what's curious about this is, it is a bit of a surprising result for Sysmark because, as I just noted a few minutes ago, the benchmark includes many tests based on different office software. And so that should be nearer to any performance index compared to something like Cinebench, which has a single purpose of only showing rendering performance, even more so when we know that Zen 2 has a vastly superior floating point unit. So again, it has to be said that it appears to be real world applications giving out results that nobody else in the tech press got with their own testing. And so for the final part of this hard look at Sysmark, I decided to dig into their white papers, going back to Sysmark 2012. And in this 2012 white paper, I found something pretty interesting on page 17, which was these sensitivity analyses They've used an i7-980X CPU with Turbo Boost disabled, so still hyper-threading. And the 980X was a 6-core 12-thread chip. And so the benchmarks were run at various clock speeds between 2.9 GHz and 3.33 GHz. The difference between those clock speeds is 13.65%. And as we can see, the overall score increases by 10.2% between those two clock speeds. So that is actually some pretty good scaling for a benchmark with the extra clock speed. Below that was a table on sensitivity to CPU cores and threads. And testing between four threads and eight threads, and then from four threads to 12 threads respectively, using the same 980X, showed scaling of 23.5% and 43.2% respectively. So in other words, with three times the cores and threads, the increase to the benchmarking was 43.2%. And this would be expected as, clearly, core count doesn't scale nearly as well as clock speeds. Moving on to Sysmark 2014, and by this point they were using an 8-core i7-5960X. That would be an 8-core 16-thread CPU, however, for some reason, they've decided to disable hyper-threading for the tests. 
and we've got a chart now to look at and we can see that again the sensitivity to CPU frequency appears to be scaling pretty well. Looking at this overall, the maximum tested frequency is 82% higher than the lower tested frequency. But for some reason, we're now seeing frequency starting at 1.5 GHz and ending at 3. But perhaps even more interesting than that was over the page, where once again we see the sensitivity to CPU core counts. In Sysmark 2012, remember, we had these 4, 8 and 12 thread tests, which is of course 2, 4 and 6 cores. But now with the new CPU, we're having 1, 2, 4 and 8 cores tested, without hyper-threading as mentioned. And sadly, due to this change in methodology, it's difficult to get a real picture of how things have changed between 2012 and the 2014 Sysmark versions. So with that in mind, we will move on to Sysmark 2018, the one that Intel are promoting today. We're now using an i9-7900X, which is of course a 10-core and 20-thread CPU. However, once again, Turbo Boost and Hyper-Threading were disabled, which is good because this time we will now see a more true apples-to-apples -apples comparison between 2008 and 2014. And as usual, they start off with the sensitivity to CPU frequency. And in this case, the overall score in yellow again, that appears to score reasonably well between 1.5 GHz and 3 GHz again, an increase of 75%. Remember, previously that was 82%, so it's gone down a little. And now again, looking at the sensitivity to the CPU core count, what's happening here? Well, first of all, let's go back to the 2014 benchmark sensitivity to core count. Back then, they also tested with one core, so one core in blue here is the baseline in this chart, whereas it's a two-core baseline in 2018. But we simply need to divide this grey four-core figure, 2.13, by this orange two-core figure, and that would give us the overall difference. So let's see, that is 2.13 divided by 1.55. That gives us 37%, and that is 37% improvement in the score for doubling the number of cores. In 2018, if you look at the yellow overall bar, the difference between 4 and 2 is 39%. So that is a small improvement there between 2 and 4 cores. Possibly a little bit too small though, considering this 4-year gap between 2014 and 2018. And we are talking only 4 cores here in 2018. Where this does get interesting though, is that you look at the difference between 2 cores and 8 cores. First of all, in 2014, we take the overall score of 2.63 and divide that by the 1.55 of the two core CPU. And that gives us a 70% higher score in 2014. However, when we move to 2018, we can see that it is only 64% higher overall. So in fact, four years later, whatever Sysmark 2018 is scoring, it is putting less emphasis on having more cores than it did during 2014, at least over that four core mark and even overall. This is a little harder to justify, and this also lately goes some way to explaining why Sysmark 2018 gives results that appear to be in disagreement with the entire tech press. It could be that the applications being benchmarked have changed to make less use of cores, but that doesn't really seem reasonable. And given what you've seen in the last five or so minutes, you would be forgiven for thinking that it's far more likely that it's Sysmark's scoring methodology that has changed instead. But now, after this longer tangent, let's get back to the slide deck. And the next one was this video on CPU performance based on real-world uses, this time comparing AMD's 3950X to Intel's 9700K. Apparently there was also a video, however, try as I might, I could not get access to it. If anybody at Intel wants to record that and email it to me, I'd be happy to see it. And over the page and we're on to gaming, with Intel selecting a bunch of games, which as you can see in this footnote here, based on popularity, tech press relevance and availability of benchmark mode. And there's a couple of things about this worth noting. And I think the first thing to note is, Far Cry 5 is known to be a terrible benchmark for AMD, which is surprising because the game carries both Radeon and Ryzen branding. I don't know if it's the inbuilt benchmark that's bad or if it's the actual gameplay. But what I do know is that Far Cry 5 is not a particularly popular game and it doesn't even make the top 100 games being played on Steam and possibly not even the top 200. 
However, Far Cry 5 does have hate press relevance, which almost certainly comes down to the fact that it does have that inbuilt benchmark. I've got a bit of an issue here though with Intel, this remark about tech press relevance being a factor. And it's a problem because we saw how they berated the tech press for benchmarking Cinebench. They had a go at the tech press because 82% were benchmarking Cinebench when it was only like 0.22% of users actually using Cinema 4D. And I mean, it's true, Cinebench gets benchmarked because it's a nice and simple benchmark, as you saw. And that does give it relevance to the tech press. But Intel, you cannot then choose to include these unpopular game titles simply because they have tech press relevance, which just tend to show your CPUs in a much better light. I mean, you can if you want to, but then you look like hypocrites. If Far Cry 5's okay, then Cinebench R20 is okay. Regarding AMD, it's just pretty abysmal that their own sponsored game titles have these issues on Zen. If it is only the inbuilt benchmark, then there are multiple ways to fix that problem. Over the page though, and the nonsense continues. We've seen Intel using this one before, game scaling by core count. And this appears to be some reasonably well-threaded games here that we can see, including Assassin's Creed Origins and Ghost Recon Wildlands. And we can see that in general, there's a reasonable increase between four and six cores, in a few of the cases at least and a bit less between 6 and 8, and then really what appears to be a complete tailing off around about the 8 core and onwards. And to be honest with you, this is all fairly reasonable based on what we see reported in the tech press. But Intel, with this in mind, this knowledge of core count scaling which you had, why do you then compare a 16 core AMD chip to an 8 core chip of your own? The answer of that is of course you wanted to show the difference in price. But this kind of marketing, it's just annoying and it's just needless. Just put the 9700K up against AMD's 8 core 3800X. Nobody's gonna complain. You're gonna be a tiny little bit more expensive and you're gonna win by a little bit more than you did against the 3950X. And what's more, people are less likely to question those results. Unlike with these. But the next part of this slide is just plain weird. Game scaling by frequency. You think that's useful information, right? but not when they start at 2.5 gigahertz and end at 3.5 gigahertz. All this tells me is that next generation consoles might actually have a really good gaming CPU. The only logical reason for Intel to show this chart, starting at 2.5 gigahertz and ending at 3.5 gigahertz is what? The answer to that is the chances are scaling doesn't look anywhere near as good between say, the far more reasonable desktop CPU values of 3.5 gigahertz and 4.5 gigahertz. We can see that in some cases already, there is a flattening out above even just three gigahertz. It's kind of what you'd expect to see in well-threaded games. You see what Intel's done here, yeah? They've taken these games that are well-threaded, but still showing that they're not scaling that well past six and eight. However, with these games being so well-threaded, they don't need as high clock speeds. And therefore, we could guess that we're going to see a pretty rapid falling off of extra performance due to extra frequency. We'll never know, I guess, because Intel didn't show us. And this whole slide is, in fact, a great way of how to fool people that aren't paying close attention. And you know what? It is just completely needless, because if they just showed the truth, it would still be in Intel's favour for this point that they're trying to make. Now, this video has taken a completely different turn to what I expected it to. I was supposed to be just looking over this slide deck, but looking how far I have scrolled down, I look like I'm just about a quarter of the way through it, if even that. So there's an awful lot to get through, so let's speed it up a bit. This Intel Performance Maximizer. I've been hearing stories about Intel pushing this to the tech press, but I'll wait and see if I can get more info on that. Over again, and we again see the 9700K up against the 3950X in what Intel is calling everyday workloads. And again, we see that it is Sysmark 2018, which instantly trashes this slide. There is more though. Note that this video editing part here, where Intel claims they are up to 2.7 times faster. That is an amazing claim. Of course, they're using their own Quick Sync, which is Intel's fixed function GPU acceleration. And they will no doubt be using the CPU cores themselves on Ryzen, as Ryzen doesn't have any of this hardware. And you might think that's fine, however, the problem here is the output from QuickSync, probably a bit worse in the quality of the output. 
and that is why it is so much faster. Now we're going to skip over these next two slides before we get to elite real world performance for gaming and creating. This constant banging off this real world drum. They seem to have missed a trick here though by not colouring it yellow. This slide caught my eye pretty quickly though, with their claim that in Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord, up to 33% more FPS compared to the previous generation, so that'll be the 9900K I think, and also up to 81% more FPS compared to a 3 year old PC. I had to check the appendix for this one. But yeah, they were actually using a 10900K up against a 9900K. And everything else regarding the system setup looks pretty standard, using the same graphics card, 2080 Ti, same drivers, same settings and resolution, etc. So with only 25% more cores and a little bit of a clock speed bump, 33% more performance for the 10900K over a 9900K? That is absolutely incredible, especially when you consider this previous slide pointing out the reduced scaling beyond 6 cores. And it's possibly even more curious because, again, over at Tom's Hardware, in their average FPS of their entire gaming suite, they only got an 8% lead for the 10900K. And so until I'm going to be calling bullshit on this one, I think. And if you're wondering how they got this 81% figure, this was the 10900K compared to the 7700K, which is, of course, only a 4-core, 8-thread chip. I would still heavily question the validity of this result, but I would note that Mountain Blade 2 almost certainly does score very well with core count, and Intel maybe just forgot to add it to their game scaling by core count slide. But moving on, and we now have a comparison at the other end with AMD's Ryzen 5 3400G up against Intel's Core i3-9100F. Now, the 3400G is AMD's previous generation, of course. That's Zen Plus. But as I noted at the top of the video, this presentation has been around since April, which was before AMD launched their much faster 3300 and 3300X chips based on Zen 2. And in this first case, Intel has compared AMD's APU graphics with their own CPU and an NVIDIA GTX 1050. And the point of this was to show that you shouldn't settle for the Ryzen 3400G if you want to play games, because 4 out of 7 were under 30 FPS and unplayable. This was at 1080p high settings though. But then over the page again, they stick the same GTX 1050 in with the 3400G. We see now that the AMD system is that bit more expensive. And over the page again, we can see that the Intel system still just wins the slightly higher frame rates at a lesser cost. This is a fair comparison. The only real issue here is that AMD now has the cheaper 3300 and 3300Xs, which in both cases are likely to perform a bit ahead of this Intel chip for a reasonably small additional cost. Otherwise, it's hard to argue. Moving on, and Sysmark again, and we're just going to ignore that. Before we see Intel's desktop claims in this nutshell. And now, before the summary, I'll go over the laptop stuff very briefly. Now first up in the premium notebook category, Intel pits their own i3-9300H up against AMD's Ryzen 7 4800H. And what is interesting here is that they used this slide by AMD, which if you remember, during CES, I called AMD out on this slide. There are a lot of people at Intel watching my stuff, so they are going to see this kind of thing. And they have every justification to use AMD's bad marketing against them. And if you recall, AMD's narrative was they had 39% better gaming performance than even the i7-9750H which was an even faster Intel CPU than Intel are comparing here themselves. How did AMD get such an incredible result? That was simple, they used 3D Mark Firestrike physics test and pretended that this is a reasonable proxy for gaming performance, when it just isn't. According to Intel though, their slower i5-9300H performs ahead of the 4800H in these real games, the comparison being made with equivalent discrete graphics cards. This Counter-Strike result looks a little bit dubious to me, but without having access to both of the machines, I just don't know. And then over the page again, they're claiming better gaming performance at a lower price. And then over again, we get to see Intel's comparison of their i7-9750H against AMD's 4800H. And we're seeing some huge wins for the Intel CPU at what is effectively the same price. And that is somewhat different to AMD's claims at CES this year. And in this case, it is AMD that are firmly in the wrong. Though I would take Intel's numbers with a grain of salt. 
even with that. And then finally, Intel claims that their 10th generation will have around about a 20% lead over AMD's flagship topped bin Ryzen 9 4900HS at a lower price. And that was pretty much that for the interesting stuff. Oh yeah, one more thing though. You remember these usage instructions at the beginning. Do not remove the disclaimers and do not delete the legal disclaimer or the appendix slides. In every single slide in this presentation, the proper disclaimer as per the FTC demands was not included, with Intel again preferring to use this nebulous for more complete information about performance and benchmark results, visit this intel.com benchmarks. Let's just do that then. And so doing so leads to this page showing that Intel has reformatted their claims and benchmark library to make it even easier to find the testing details that support the performance and power claims that they make in public marketing materials. And if we scroll down at the bottom of this page, we can see that they are using the proper FTC disclaimer which was basically that performance tests such as SysMark and MobileMark are measured using specific computer systems, etc, etc. And if we click on one of these links, let's click on the desktop one, you can see that we have this same disclaimer up at the top. I wouldn't have been completely happy with that. However, at the end, they do have this legal disclaimer in the presentation, which basically points out the same stuff, including SysMark and now the web expert, while also saying that they contribute to the development of benchmarks by participating in, sponsoring, and contributing technical support to various benchmarking groups. And they include principal technologies in that. And so based on what we saw months ago, in early December, when I had a real go at them for their marketing, they do appear to have cleaned up their act a little bit. And this, to me, is just about acceptable overall. All right, to finish this long video off, I had no idea what I would discover when I started looking through this Pretty large presentation, in fact. I had a quick once over it before I started the video, obviously, so that at least I knew that I would have something worth talking about. When I saw stuff like this core count slide and the frequency slide, and also this stuff about not removing the disclaimers, I knew I'd have at least enough for a short video. And then, during my research, as usual, it has morphed into something else entirely. Intel's constant reliance on SysMark, which has not been able to shake off accusations of bias for two decades now, it is no longer working for them in the tech press or in the enthusiast community. This is tainted. It's that simple. And so now they are pushing this same agenda at the channel and retail, and it will have some success there. The average shop floor Best Buy or PC World Assistant, they're lately going to fall for this real world mantra. And Intel are pushing it hard. And very few of these people on the shop floor will have any clue about the dubious sources behind these results. And what really bugs me about this is that it's actually pretty needless. Intel does have some advantages still over Zen too, especially in gaming. And especially in these popular games, which tend to be lower threaded. Although it has to be said that many of these games run absolutely great on even lower end hardware. But this is still a real world advantage, although I'm sure it's a lower one than their marketing would have you believe. But all of this here, that is still much better than what AMD tried to make you believe when they pushed this dreadfully misleading slide on us back at CES. And so it's been a bit of a mixed bag to be honest with you. Sysmark is a real problem, but Intel can't win with something that is unbiased, so they have to use it. But so long as they continue to use this mark in their marketing materials, I am going to find it extremely hard to be nicer to their marketing. But as I said, their gaming stuff does appear to be justified. And the disclaimers are back. Kind of. What's going to happen after Zen 3 launches though? Because I don't think they'll have anything left. And even this mark may struggle to show any kind of advantage for them. I guess I will have to pay even closer attention to the shadier goings on then in the wicked world of bench marketing. I'll catch you later, guys.